Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Tara Faraday. I am the ACA um, Learning Design Manager, and I'm going to be moderating our discussion tonight. This is the fourth in a series of five live stream panel discussions being sponsored by the ACA Board of Directors. You can join the fifth and final discussion on May 8th about our five-year strategic plan and the rollout, and that'll be hosted by some of the board members and some of the ACA staff. Tonight, we have an incredible group of panelists here to discuss what um, growth-minded leadership and education is, what that looks like, and how, as we, we as leaders, how do we do that? Um, so we have an amazing group of leaders in our ACA community that are not only heavily involved in the ACA as instructors, instructor trainers, instructor trainer educators, but also each one of these amazing people owns their own business and are deeply involved in their communities in fostering amazing paddlers and people um, using paddling as a conduit for that change. So we have Anna Levesque here. She's the chair of our SEIC board. She's based in Asheville, North Carolina, and uh, is the owner and founder of Mind Body Paddle, uh, she's a mental agility coach, whitewater coach, yoga instruct, sup instructor, and she also just launched a brand new podcast called The Discomfort Zone, which is very aligned with our conversation tonight. We have Trey Rouse, who originally is from Arizona, but is based in uh, Lansing, Michigan, where he runs and owns The Power of Water, which is a paddle sports shop instruction school for multiple crafts and adventure travel. So learning to paddle in cool places. Really, Trey is an innovator and collaborative instructor who uses paddle sports craft to um, help create transformative experiences on and off the water. Bev Coslett is joining us from South Carolina. She um, is based in James Island and owns a small business focusing on paddle sport instruction and camping expedition adventures. Bev serves on the board as well as the Regional Activity Council with the ACA. And lastly, we have Alicia McArthur coming from Colorado. She is a raft guide instructor, has been on rivers her entire life, and is the owner of a rafting company in a um, on the Arkansas River in Colorado called Canyon River Instruction. And she specializes in raft and swift water rescue. So such 
amazing experience here with you all. Thank you for taking the time to be part of this conversation tonight. Um, I would love for you all just to share um, what is growth-minded leadership and education to you in your own words. What are we talking about tonight? Uh, Anna, if you'd like to kick us off. Sure. Thanks, Tara. I'm uh, happy to be here and honored to be here with these amazing folks. And uh, thanks all of you all who are listening. Appreciate appreciate all of you. So thanks for tuning in. For me, growth-minded leadership is that if when I step in to be a leader, I don't step in as the one who has all the answers. I don't step in as the one who uh, must be in charge or leading even from the front always, although I do do that. For me, it's about uh, recognizing my own humanity, that I'm going to make mistakes, that I'm going to learn from my mistakes, and that there are always opportunities to grow and learn and get better and learn from the folks who I'm quote unquote leading, right, in any given moment. So that's what comes to mind for me when I think about growth minded leadership, not being afraid to fail, uh, not having to have all the answers and always uh, developing myself as a student first. That's awesome, Anna. Thanks for sharing. Bev, what about for you? So for me, um, uh, I agree wholeheartedly a lot with what Anna uh, described. But to add to that, I would say I like to demonstrate um, active listening um, as, a, as an instructor and also as a student. Um, if you demo that kind of behavior, then you get that kind of treatment back. Um, the other thing um, that I'm very focused on right now is reflection. So that's personal reflection of my own performance, my own whatever I'm, whether I'm teaching or a student. Also reflection in in my classes and asking for feedback so that so that I can understand how I've affected uh, the situation and so that I can learn. So it's a two way street. Um, so listening and reflection are kind of my key focus areas. Yeah, I, I, I think um, absolutely to everything that both of you have already said. And I, I think for me, it's definitely like just being a, in a perpetual student role. Um, you know, like Anna said, like, you're not just the leader, you are also learning. And I, I feel like my students are often surprised when I tell them that I'm looking forward to learning from them. <laughs> Um, and, and I think it's that that concept of growth mindset is that we are we are constantly in a state of growth. Like as soon as we are in that fixed place of I know everything because I'm the teacher and I'm the leader and I'm in charge, then suddenly we've lost so much. Like not only have we lost our own opportunity, but we've lost our students at that point, too. Um, and and. Yeah, I guess, like I say, for me, the best way to sum that up is just being being in perpetual student mode, being open, being and being vulnerable. I think being vulnerable is a huge part of that. Um, like you guys were saying, being willing to make mistakes, being willing to learn from failures and demonstrating that uh, and being humble about it, being like, "Ooh, man, you guys, I just really screwed that up. Hold on. Let me try again. <laughs> or, um, if somebody asks a question that you don't know the answer to, instead of trying to BS your way through an answer, just saying, you know what, actually, I don't know. Let's see if we can find out. Um, and, and so being in that place of perpetual growth for yourself and is like, Hey, you're winning because you're learning and you're growing and you're becoming better at everything that you do. And, just being an overall human. Um, and then and you're also, yeah, actively demonstrating that to your students. Um, that's kind of how it feels for me. I guess that's me. Uh, Anna said, I'm supposed to refer to you all as the boss ass bitches. So <laughs> how, how y'all doing? I even, I even dropped a y'all in there. Uh, as you could probably <laughs> tell, uh, for me, it, it, it's, it's this, it's being here right now, actually. It's this awkwardness 
Um, and it's, it's acknowledging for me personally and honestly first that, that I have fixed mindset about a lot of things. I think we all do. And yet still being willing to take the action to embrace the processes, whatever they may be. Um, I'm uncomfortable in these situations, yet I put myself into these situations and try and find learning and growth within them. And yes, we all have goals and desired outcomes, but really not holding on to those outcomes and just holding on to the process, what it feels like right now. And uh, yeah, seeing where that takes us, reflecting on that, and then moving forward to the next thing. So nice. Yeah, that's awesome. You all hit so many like really key points when we, if you look up this concepts later, I think the being able to consider yourself first is so important as a student and then being able to model that and sit in the discomfort and sit in that. Trey, would you want to share a little bit more about how this approach first impacts you, um, but also your team and your leader and those that you're leading? Like, How have you seen that impact in your practice? Well, for me, I would say that it impacts me by uh, instilling the, the joy and the desire to continue on, to be quite honest. Um, mm -hmm. People always ask, don't you get bored or aren't you tired of this? Or why are you doing so much of this or that? And it's always fresh and it's always rewarding uh, as long as I'm conscious of where I'm trying to find those rewards. And sometimes I'm surprised. And as far as with the team, you know, as you start to to step back and lead from, from it's, it's, it's inside, but it's also outside. Um, you start to let people be empowered to, to lead their own journeys, even though you're guiding that along. And when you experience that growth, then they bring you into the experience. And all of a sudden you're doing things as a team that you never thought would be possible, even walking into the, to the experience to begin with. And, and it's usually pretty messy and painful at the beginning. And, but having, having trust in that process and being honest with, with your team and with yourself by modeling and sharing with each other what it is that we're doing, then I, I find that there's there's success there and it seems to it just seems to work. Does anyone else want to jump in on that? I I mean I, I agree with what Trey said. Go ahead, Bev. You're about to say something. Go for it. No, I I mean I, what it means to me, um as a participant, it, it frees me to, to relax and be creative and explore what I don't know. And, um, and as a teacher, for me, it, um, I just love it when, you know, you, you come across someone who might, you know, feel a little reserved and, um, and then they get to know you because they see that you're going to be open, that what they have to say is important. Um, and to see them open up and to learn and to grow from that is super satisfying for me. I really enjoy that. Yeah, and to add on to what you just said, Bev, when people feel seen and heard, then they're no longer in survival mode. And so their learning really opens up. Same thing for me, at, you know, and and so I really liked what you you just said. You know, as leaders, it's important that we hear and see people in in our classes and we want and if we all if we're honest with ourselves we all want to be seen heard respected loved you know that's the kind of human human side of it and so giving that giving what we want to receive can be so powerful yeah for sure Alicia how have you seen this mindset impact um, those that you're leading, whether that be here in the States or you just got back from India um, across the globe? How are you how are you seeing this um, have a positive impact in those around you? Um, I, I mean, like in so many ways. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think that I, I think that unfortunately we don't always get those teachers that have that type of vulnerability and that 
you know, that aren't necessarily leading from a place of growth mindset themselves. And um, so I think that when a, you know, you're working with a student from that place, it can be really powerful. And, um, and I, I definitely, sometimes there are hiccups along the way though. Right. And, and that's part of that, like being like getting, getting comfortable with the discomfort, right. Is that, um, sometimes that's scary. Sometimes it's scary as hell. And, you know, you're like already in this kind of scary environment of like, for me, whitewater, right. Is the environment that I, I tend to work in and whitewater is a, you know, legitimately like scary thing. And so you're like, people are already outside of their comfort zones and then learning let's, let's be honest, learning can be really hard. Right. And, and so you have people that are like so far outside of their comfort zones and, and then they're kind of like expecting this like straight up model of what they've always seen as teaching. Like actually one of the women who took this guide school in India last week, she's um, an engineer and she was halfway through the class. She said, you know, you guys, I just have to tell you that this is mind blowing, like all through university, all through school, no one has ever taught me this way. And I am just sponging so much more. I feel like I'm learning so much more from this type of an environment that I ever learned in, you know, secondary school or university or on my path to become an engineer. And, and so, and some people, I think that's, you know, they're open to it and they gravitate to it really quickly. And then for other people that can be, that can kind of add to that discomfort and be a little scarier. And um, because it's a new thing, right? And and if you're modeling that, hey, let's get comfortable with this discomfort, then like suddenly they have to as well. <laughs> and And so, and I'm going to say probably three quarters of the students that I work with respond really well. And about a quarter of them need a little bit of extra space, maybe even a little bit of extra love <laughs> in order to move past their barriers and their fears to get to a place of being able to learn of being comfortable with failure of you know the, those kinds of spaces where you are in that growth mindset um i actually had an instructor candidate uh earlier this year who was really 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 struggling with the concept of growth mindset and i i ended up you know amazing paddler really nice guy was not like like very very fixed mindset and really struggling to like engage with the group and kind of Yeah, really struggling to just learn and grow himself and and be comfortable in that discomfort and 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 I, I'm actually working with him just kind of on the side with growth mindset concepts. Like, you know, I send him material, we have conversations. I think he's slowly but surely getting it. Um, but yeah, and so like I say, I've, I I feel like most folks gain so much from this model and for some folks, it makes it a little harder and they just need a little extra extra care to get to the point where they can operate from a place of growth mindset. Yeah, that's really good. I would love to hear from Anna or Trey or Bev and that on that thought process of this, how do you support people getting comfortable with that messy middle, like learning is uncomfortable and to sit in that space and embrace it. And um, as instructors or instructor candidates, um, having those challenging conversations is part of it too. And so um, if any of you have success or <laughs> things you've learned that didn't go well and you've learned from the, those spaces, but how in, in, in your spaces, how are you um, helping people be in that space and see the value in it and experience the value in it. Do you want to start us off, Anna? And then Bev or Trey can jump in. 
Sure. I think it's, it's already been said. I think both, uh, I think everyone has said modeling what you, um, that vulnerability. So that's one key thing for me is, is modeling that vulnerability. Also, clear communication is so important when you're talking about setting up a space, at least for me. And where I have experienced like failure as a leader is typically when I don't give enough information or I don't communicate clearly enough at the beginning and set that up. And then there's like a void that people fill with their own kind of um, ideas or assumptions. And so really taking that on and it's, a, I think making mistakes is part of the journey and then learn and then being willing to admit and clean it up. And the cleaning it up part is important. I think not only is clear communication and really important ahead of time and so that folks know what to expect and that um, uh, in terms of, yeah, what to expect depending on what you're teaching them, like in an ICW, that the outcomes and the possibilities and how it's going to flow is one thing. And then the other part of it is finishing strong. You know, as humans, we can get really lackadaisical at the end of something like, oh, I've done 75%, it's good. Or, you know, but really taking the course, like being present, like Trey was saying, being enthusiastic. I see Jeff Adkins is saying, make it fun, make it fun all the way till the end, even in the difficult conversations. And if you, for instance, in an ICW, if someone doesn't get certified at the level that they were thinking they would get certified at, if you have built a, uh, a relationship of trust and modeling vulnerability throughout, then you can still finish strong having that conversation and having them leave feeling empowered um, even though they may not have gained what they thought they came in to gain in the beginning. Wow. Yeah, you, uh, you I, just, um, whoops, sorry, go ahead. Go, Beth. No, go, Beth. Well, Anna just uh, talked a lot about what I was going to say. I, I like to use um, and stay super upbeat and fun um, and just finding creative ways to, um, to make light of things. I mean, we're all out here to have fun and enjoy the outdoors and the water. And that's what's important. Um, and I think people sometimes need to be reminded of that. And if you you demonstrate that yourself by, you know, owning your own mistakes or, uh, you know, expressing how you're feeling um, and just trying to keep it light is a good thing. Yeah, and bringing humor into it, right, Bev? Like, if you make a mistake, and, and Elisha said this, oh, I've, so many times I've demoed something and been like, ha ha, that's, that was terrible. Let me try that again. And I'm laughing, and it's, I'm not like letting it ruin my day. And I think that that's key too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would, I would contribute the idea of having trust in yourself and in the team that you're working with that you did the preparation prior so that your communication does feel clear or they are have had the opportunities to be prepared for the the workshop or the experience that they're going to have and then be willing to to work through those trust issues and continue to earn them and, and i think of an experience that i had recently uh, in tampa where i like to start workshops now in the last couple of years i've been playing around with even though we all know how the workshop's going to go, we give the participants the, the opportunity to build the workshop themselves and share their contributions and what they bring to the, to the event or the, the workshop. And then we kind of build it out from there to fit within the curriculum that we're, we're addressing. And I started this workshop off like that after we listened to a little music first, which some people liked and some people were like, well, what are we doing here? And and we're going around sharing what it is uniquely that we bring to this workshop and what makes us nervous or uncomfortable about this workshop. And this is like in the first 10 minutes of meeting these people in, in, in our spot. We're just sitting in the, in the classroom and we're going around and everybody's getting pretty real and it's, you know, it's a little awkward and uh, some good, really good stuff. And but these these women and men were already quite strong leaders in their own field. They're sharing a lot of contributions. 
some uncomfortableness maybe with water or being underwater or being in large groups, the, the typical things. And we come around to this one woman and she looks me right in the eye and she's like, you know what makes me uncomfortable? This. You and the way you're running this program right now makes me extremely uncomfortable. And I was just like, and inside I'm thinking, okay, I just got to, you know, you, you learn this idea of, or I have in, in past parts of my life, this idea of just push on through, fake it till you make it, whatever. But I literally, my jaw dropped. Like you could feel it was like, whoa. And I know my complexion, everything changed. I was like, wow. All right. And I, we just kind of sat with it. The room sat with it and we just continued to move on. She put it out there. We honored it. Uh, didn't panic, but was like, oh my gosh, this like, maybe this stuff doesn't work. Maybe I'm wrong, or maybe this is not going to go right. And then having the patience and the honesty and the follow through, as, as Anna mentioned earlier, you know, three days later, we're out in the little lagoon off the ocean and we're doing something where we're all swimming and playing underneath the kayaks and and stand up paddle boards and canoes. And it's, it's a total chaos and a mess or so it seems. And this woman comes up from underneath this boat where she'd been under for like a minute, shakes her hair all out and just looks up at the whole world. She's like, who am I? <laughs> and she meant it in the most positive way because she was able to move through that, that fixed mindset that she had about all this stuff. Like my hair's wet and I've been underwater and this is brackish weird water and there's alligators, well, you know, just going on and on. And it just brought the whole team together in a way that that was really, really powerful. So it can take time and you have to have patience with it. Uh, but I think that if you're, if you prepare yourself and you're open to the experience, then, then the outcomes tend to tend to deliver. Great story. I see in the chat, Michael Gray says, mistakes mean greater learning for all. And that's a wonderful little phrase, all in mm -hmm. a nutshell. Yeah, one of our leaders in, in our community, Ann Sontheimer, who's now chair of River Kayak Committee, she is so good about calling things opportunities. I mean, she just, from the time I met her, she was one of my mentors, from the time I met her, She's always calling those things, whether they're mistakes or not quite rights or total disasters. It's always looked at as an opportunity. And that, that really sticks with me. Thanks for that, Michael. Yeah, this idea of embracing failure and, and reframing it, right? Mindset is just how we engage with the world and how we see it. So how... And not, like you said earlier, I think, and you said it, like not holding out on, holding on to outcomes. Um, and that's this, that is what growth mindset is, is being able to embrace this space. So um, have any of you had similar stories or, or success or ways that you've navigated and then really help people embrace the learning process is what it is, right? Because we're not, we're taking a failure and being able to say like, no, that this is just an opportunity for growth. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on that. I would just say real quick, cause it just brought up this, just a real short little story that I heard on somebody's podcast. I can't give the proper attribution. I apologize for that. But this gentleman was sharing about how they have a wall of failure in their house and that his girls, they're like seven and eight years old or whatever. When they come home from school, they have to write on the wall of failure. And it sounds like this, oh my gosh, what a horrible parent, how could this be? But it's actually the place of the most joy for the family because it's all the things that they tried and experimented with and just looked at it as we, we all have to, there is no way you can learn. It's not learning if you're not failing, like then it wouldn't be learning, you'd already be doing it. it that's just how the brain works, failure is good. Mm -hmm. That's what you do with it. So um, I, I think to like, I, I had a really interesting experience with this women's guide school that I was teaching in India last week. And, um, you know, Trey, like you said, we, we all have a fixed mindset to some degree. Like we have, we have our, um, 
you know, cultural upbringing, we have, we've got, you know, generational, we've, we've got all of this like baggage that we hold with us that we may or may not be aware of. Right. And, um, at one point I'm, I'm working with these girls on flip and recovery and we're just practicing climbing in an upright raft. And granted, these are big 16 foot rafts, but all these girls are, you know, they're super strong and, you know, they're already like kayakers and raft racers or, you know, a good bit of them. Um, and anyways, like I demonstrate climbing in the raft and I'm, I'm standing there in the raft and I'm, you know, expecting them all to start climbing in and like nothing's happening. I'm standing there looking all around me and the raft is just surrounded by girls and they're all holding onto the perimeter line somewhere. Like not a single one is reaching for the things that I've rigged to like help climb in. Right. You know, like nobody's reaching for the strap or, you know, trying to, you know, make themselves a step with the flip line or, and they're just all just kind of holding onto the perimeter line, kind of bobbing in the water and occasionally would like half-heartedly try to mantle like the boys do. Um, but not, not even like, not even really trying. And, and I realized that while we've got our own cultural issues, um, the cultural issues that these girls are dealing with are even stronger when it comes to that, you know, they've always been told that they can't do this, that girls can't be raft guides, that, you know, they're not strong enough, that they'll never be able to, that, you know, they have been told over and over and over by their brothers who are raft guides and by their uncles who are raft guides, that girls can't climb in rafts. That it's just something that girls cannot do. And so they're assume, and so like, they're all trying the way the boys do, but not even trying. And, and I'm looking around going like, what the heck is going on here? And finally, I, I, I just say, hey, ladies, I know that this seems like a really hard thing. And climbing in a raft is a hard thing. But I also know that you can do hard things. And I know for a fact that every single one of you girls can get yourself in this raft. And as soon as I said that, the first one popped in and then the next one popped in and then they all started coming over to the strap that I'd rigged and one by one just started climbing in and suddenly they were elated and they were like, Oh my God, we can do this. <laughs> but, but again, it, it was one of those like barriers that they had to get through in terms mm -hmm. of their own, just, they'd always been told it was something that they couldn't do. So they assumed they couldn't do it. And, and so just like breaking through those, those belief systems and those fixed mindsets that we may or may not even realize that we have. And, and for me as an instructor, it was realizing that this was like one more layer of, of culture that, you know, I wasn't necessarily aware of that I had to help them through. And um, yeah, I don't know. It was just the, those ingrained beliefs that sometimes we get to dig through both, both as students and instructors. Agree. Mm -hmm. Totally. I, I don't like to use the word failure. And every time I have a teaching opportunity, I'm always looking forward to building my language so that the, what I'm saying isn't you failed. It's, this is what you did. And, you know, you can say it with enthusiasm, I mean, I've never experienced anybody who didn't grow in some way or learn something um, in, in their feedback. Um, and so I think language is something I like to pay attention to, um, both as a student and a, as an instructor. Yeah, you know, we, we're, we create our world through language. We're always having a conversation. The conversation is either, is either with someone else or with ourselves. And so what we're saying about the world or or we're either and we're either describing the world or we, we're creating our world with our language like to your point bev and uh, elisha i loved your story like a beautiful story of exactly that like you recreated their world 
in a different way by using language. And I think that's so powerful. And I like to coach as well. And I got this from a program called Landmark Forum, where they talk about that there's the facts and then there's the story that you tell yourself about the facts. And most of our suffering comes from the story. I'm mirrored weird on my screen. So I, can't, I actually am like, which hand is it? So story, story and then the so wait, facts, and then the story that we tell ourselves about the facts. And most of our suffering is in the story. It's not actually about what happened. It's what we're telling ourselves about what's happening. And if we can reframe the story we're telling ourselves about what, what's happening, you know, as a leader, like if there's someone that's really frustrating us in our course, for instance, it's up to us to reframe, right, of what's going on. Like Bev said, this is just what happened. This, this person said this. Okay, what am I making that mean? And I do this all the time. We all make stuff mean something. And being willing to recognize that we're telling ourselves a story and that our lens, the lens we're looking through, the story we're telling ourselves is not the truth. You know, as humans, we tend to live, we tend to take the story, our lens as the truth. And I, I think being a growth minded leader is being able to know that it's not the truth. It's simply a lens we're looking through. It's a story we're telling ourselves. And that frees us up. It's very empowering because then we get, we have a lot more choice. That was huge. I actually just wrote that down <laughs> to remind myself later that suffering is from the story, not the facts. <laughs> yeah, I need to hear it all the time. Yeah, right. Obviously, me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that goes back to the concept at the very beginning that this starts with us as being the student and as the leader. And so we have to own it ourselves and sit in that discomfort and recognize that we have to own the fact versus the story. So if we're modeling this to who's in front of us, um, whether it be a friend that you're taking out or instructor candidate, it doesn't really matter because it's just about being where you are and who you are. Um, I would love to hear, um, with that in mind as being the student and being in this space of constantly pursuing and a better mindset because it's not you can't fix get a fixed mindset of i have arrived at a growth mindset like we're always in the process of changing and growing and so for all of you what have been tools that you have relied on um whether it be a practice or a habit um a podcast, a person, a book, what has spurred this growth in you? Um, and what are you using to continue down this road in this process? Um, for those that are participating and watching and adding comments in the chat, like where, where can we go um, from here? Maybe there's people that have never heard of this concept before, and they're just curious to get started. Maybe they're been in this journey for a while and want to continue it. Um, what, what's been something that you've really valued in this growth process for yourself. Uh, Bev, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, so one of the things I value is just, um, and, and I'm able to do this is consulting with a lot of people and not necessarily, and, and seeking training from people that I, I may not know, or maybe, um, I may not really identify with um, and just broadening my exposure to, I really like one-on-one -on -one training uh, or personal in-person training. I mean, I do read books and I love watching podcasts and, you know, there's a lot of great ones out there, but I, I focus on arranging my life so that I can grab sources from all the interactions I get with different people. Mm. So um, this is going to sound kind of silly, but when my daughter was little, I got her this journal called the Big Life Journal. And, you know, like she was just at, in like in kindergarten, she was just like struggling with, you know, like self-image and all of that 
kind of horrible stuff already and confidence. And um, so I, I found this and it was actually just a startup company at the time. It's called Big Life Journal. Um, and it started with this kids journal that's all about helping kids with growth mindset. And um, I think they actually have an adult journal too and like a teen one now and all kinds of cool stuff. But it was a really neat thing. And like, and I would sit down and do it with her in the evenings. Um, and, I, and I think for me, you know, this would have been like well over 10 years ago. She's 16 now. Um, and I think for me, that was kind of like some of my introduction to the concepts of growth mindset. And um, I, I learned a lot from that little kid's journal. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's actually a resource that I still use. So I, I still get their like, you know, emails and, and I just do the, like the, the Sunday mindset for grownups tip email, <laughs> but it's one that I read every Sunday and it's usually got really good tips. Um, there was actually one recently that was like something about lucky person syndrome and and interestingly i'm someone who has always felt very lucky and reading through their like lucky person syndrome i was like oh okay that makes sense to me yeah these are like <laughs> concepts that i've always like embodied and embraced and like i'm not just lucky i guess i've kind of created luck i, I mean i don't know it, it was um anyways yeah big life journal is a is a pretty cool resource that even though it was originally created for kids um, is a resource for for people of all age these days, and I still get a lot out of it. So, Big Life Journal. For me, it would be if I had to name a book that still resonates deeply in my life. It would be the Rock Warrior, the Rock Warrior Way by Arno Ilgner, and it's really yeah, it's about climbing, but it's it's really not, it's about life and anything that you do. And it's, it's really about how to be honest with yourself. Um, and as far as, you know, simple things that you can do for me, what I'm playing around with right now is how to take action or not take action. I think that's, you know, we all talk about all these concepts and we kind of all identify with them and, and it's hard to actually put that stuff into action. It's easy to say all this stuff, but to actually, what are the action steps that we're doing? And, and to, to break it down even further, I think we all love to skip steps. I know that as a human being and a, as a person that I definitely do, not as much as I used to, but I definitely do. And so how do we skip the step of learning, of taking the action to learn how to take action, if that makes sense? And so like, how far can you back it up? So, you know, one thing that I play around with right now is that idea of, you know, every, not everybody, a lot of people have heard about or play around with cold water immersion. And that has its own benefits for psychoactive principles, whatever you might want to think about that in and of itself. But the other part of it is that desire that you have to sit with. And I like to do it in the shower where my hand is on the shower valve so I could change the temperature at any time <laughs> and understand that it, it's really cold and saying, okay, it is just what it is. I could right now change this, but I'm not going to do that. And, and, and play with that little bit right there, just that little toggle, because that allows me to then play with other little toggles when it comes to places where I may want to take action or may not want to take, take action. And it, and it can be quite fun, believe it or not. That's what I've come to find from it. So, which means that now if it's fun, I probably need to move on to a different <laughs> challenge because now I'm kind of comfortable with it. So yeah, that's me. I love that. I did an ice bath for the first time this winter and mm. I, it was in Costa Rica. So it was warm Easy and I was, I was blown away by the benefits actually, like the mindset benefits yeah. of staying in for like, I surprised myself too, staying in for like six minutes anyway. That I, I was not a believer. I was, and now I'm like, oh, this stuff works. I think for me, a program called, I already mentioned it, Landmark Forum has been huge in my life for, for me and, and my husband and uh, creating the life that we want to live. And uh, so I highly recommend, and that is a, like a training. So personal development training and then anything by Brene Brown. Adam Grant 
is another author, Hidden Potential, Think Again, which we've actually, in our SEIC emails over this year, I think both Trey and I have recommended those books. And then another book that's really great is The Four Agreements, um, is also a really great quick read that starts, you know, growing self-awareness. So, and then yoga, Ayurveda. I mean, I have so much training. I, I love to learn and I love personal development and I love um, growing my self-awareness, even me when it's really painful, because when we look at ourselves, you know, people think that yoga and meditation is all about being blissful. It's not at all. Yoga and Ayurveda is about, um, you know, freedom through discipline, showing up even when you don't want to, mm -hmm. sitting with yourself. And, and like, sometimes it's hard to be like, oh, man, I have to sit with this mind, with myself, with my past, with my present. Um, and that is not blissful a lot of times. And so those are, you know, any of those things and all of them have helped me out in my life for sure. And my, I'll put a plug in for my podcast, my new podcast, the discomfort zone, check it out. I think there's some, there's some sweet stuff in there from different guests that I have on. I've been enjoying your podcast, Anna, and I would totally agree. It's very aligned with this conversation. I think that self-awareness piece is so important. Like you said, Trey, you're like, well, wait a second. I'm having fun here. I'm no longer in a place of discomfort. So what's next? And I think there is this, like, we can like trick our brains into thinking that we are in a challenging place or we're in it. And really, no, we've like created a very comfortable, like to the outside, it might look discomfortable, totally. but like we've created this space to be like, oh yeah. And then to truly be self-aware and honest, I think goes back to what you said at the beginning, Alicia, is that vulnerability. You have to be vulnerable with yourself first. And then obviously share that out with other people in, in true vulnerability. But I think to be self-aware and to be vulnerable with yourself first is where it has to begin because we can't make progress or growth if we're not aware of where we are or even willing to admit that that's where we are. Um, I saw so, a few things in the chat. So if you're listening in and you have a favorite resource, a favorite habit, something that you're using in your own practice, definitely add that into the chat and others can learn from it. Um, unless you, anyone here has final thoughts or ideas, we can transition to uh, just some open question um, and answer time. We'll give people uh, a little bit of time to throw some things in the chat or. Um, Casey or Joseph, if you've seen some come through that you want to pop up on the screen, I'll go back through as well. Um, or for our panelists, while we're waiting for some to come in through the comment section, do you have any questions for each other just having listened to each other? I don't have any questions. I've really enjoyed listening to everyone here. I've, I've Again, and I would say that's also something that's really important is anytime I co-teach or co-lead or co-present or on panels with other people, not showing up like, oh, I can't wait to tell other people what I know, but rather in that active listening of like, what gems am I going to get to learn from folks? I mean, tonight I've just picked up so much. It's really cool. That's and I appreciate good storytellers like Trey and Elisha. That's a thing. It's something I would like to develop more is being a good storyteller. So I love to listen to people who are. Yeah. Hands down. My favorite part of co-teaching with others is learning from them. <laughs> um, and I, I also like, I love taking ICWs um, and I, Actually, I recently let my canoe instructor cert lapse. Um, I mean, part of it was I was, wasn't was able to make any updates. My schedule's a little crazy. But really, my excuse was that that way I have to retake a full ICW in order to get my instructor cert back. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting. We were on a call earlier today. And... and how like if, if we take this to the organizational level and, and stretch it out to the ACA itself, you know, how do these things fit into to what we do, whether it's on the SEIC in specifically 
or at the, the organization as a whole. And there is such this challenge of we want um, structure, um, but not specificity, although people want specificity. And it's hard to have a growth mindset if we have lots of specificity. Um, and so how do we as an organization provide that structure, enough structure to where there still allows for those experiences of learning within that? Because if we, if, if it's all just set down and this is what it is, like there's so many things, every time I run a course, I'm learning something different and I have changed the way mm -hmm. I do rescues or the way we teach towing or it's come from the students. If I would have just given them, here's yeah. the curriculum, this is what it is. We, I wouldn't be paddling and, and performing and learning and playing the way I am now, if that would have been the case. And so, yeah, we do need some of that. And I think it's, it's a really big challenge that we face. And I'm, I'm, you know, I think we're all here to take it on and it just, but gosh, you know, we can't let go of what we're talking about here. Cause we're all talking about the learning and the growing. Mm -hmm. I get the question a lot from people. Well, am I doing this right? <laughs> and I never answer that question. I always say, well, how do you do it? How does it work for you? What do you think is good about it? So it's not being specific. It's not having a, well, this is right and that's wrong. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. it's open. And really, I think it's, it's really back to that language thing again. Um, but it's also an approach, which is there's really no right and wrong in all of this. We're all learning. It's just an experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jeff added in the chat so that it's a uh, structured flexibility is the language for that concept of boundaries um, facilitating. And then Julie said, I always like the goal. I want to get better. Like there's no specificity in that. Yeah, and, I, and Michael says, he asks the question, aren't we always co-teaching with our participants? And that's a great yeah. way to frame it, Michael. Yeah, really great. Love, love that. I mean, that's and it, I Yeah, and it's, it's, it's not necessarily something that, is I think traditionally intuitive because I think I'll use the word traditionally there's that language I don't know if that's the right word but you know we're brought up to think like I'm the teacher I give instructions I know I was brought up even within the ACA like that as an IT and as an ITE and it took me some time to really understand like what Michael's saying and that I don't have to have all the answers. And there's so much pressure that we put on ourselves. Like if, if we are the only ones, like the keepers of the information and we have to have all the answers and like, that is so much pressure and stressful and, and like pigeonhole. That's, that's really hard. And that is no fun when y'all are talking about like, Jeff Adkins was talking about fun, recreation. Bev was talking about fun. Like it's hard to have fun when unless unless your fun is to is to dominate people. <laughs> Which some people's fun, some people's oh, fun yeah. is. And I think I think that we all have to be aware that is a very also normal human thing. We're always trying to either avoid being dominate dominated or trying to dominate that's like it's a survival mechanism and that it's really important to be aware of that um, especially if we're leaders and especially our desire sometimes to dominate people and to let go of that hmm. at least for myself I'll, I'll speak just for myself I shouldn't speak broadly <laughs> I would agree with you on that one yeah it's a delicate okay. balance but that's one that I haven't really thought about, but I think you're right. That probably is a survival instinct that we need to have an awareness of. Well, the other survival instinct, though, is also the socialization piece. That's true. And, and the learning happens through that socialization. And I think that 
you know, many, oftentimes I've stood to the side of a group of paddlers and had side conversations to the effect of, we're not like these people, are we? Like, you know, it's kind of a weird lot. And the reality is that we are like these people. We are these people. And, and a lot of us were not super social or super comfortable in the social zone. Uh, there's not lots of cheerleaders and football players and all team sports people involved in the paddling community, at least the, the folks that I deal with as a, as a whole. And yet we still do need that socialization, right? Like we do need to share with each other. We do need to be with each other. Mm-hmm. And, and some of us, to your point, want to dominate or be better than that. That's, that's the need that they have. And so it is all part of the mix uh, and, and acknowledging it is, is the start. That's that honesty bit. Mm. I hope I didn't offend anybody there. <laughs> you just push them into their discomfort zone. Okay. Keep forgetting that we're talking to more than just the, the five badass bitches. I don't know. I think you hit the nail on the head, Craig. Paddlers, paddlers are more the antisocial type of creatures. At, le- at least I know I am. That's what they want to think, but they're they really all weird because they all come together. That's the thing about it. That's the beauty of it, right? We're the, we're the counterculture. Yeah. <laughs> and the counterculture becomes, but then there's the like dominant culture within the counterculture. Yeah. That's there's true. The, That's very true. The okay. classic South Park of the, where they're like following the cure or something and they have like the goths and they're the nonconformists. And they were trying to get everybody to conform to being right. nonconformist. Exactly. And, and Butters was outcast because he wasn't conforming to being a nonconformist. Like, totally. Like people. Totally. <laughs> um, well, I don't see any other questions coming through, but I just think, um, Bev, what you said earlier on, of, and to Trey's point, like we do need each other and we have to learn from each other. And so I would just... Um, I believe our, all of our emails will end up in the chat. Um, so if they're, if you're listening, curious to learn more or want more resources, like definitely reach out to anyone here, but also reach out to the people in your community. And if this is a brand new concept of a way to approach, not just learning, but kind of life, um, and you want to say, get other people excited about it, like this recording will be able to be shared out. It'll be on the website. Um, But as you start looking into this concept of growth-minded, this was specifically looking at leaders and growth-minded leaders in education. But if you just look up growth mindset, there are so many podcasts and resources to start this. And it starts with you, right? It just starts with Mm -hmm. us being vulnerable and honest with where we're at and what we want to learn but not in isolation. We need each other. Um, and Trey, you always say this with the ACA, like it's not the ACA as this mythical thing. We are the ACA. Like everybody here in this panel, we are the ACA. Everyone listening that's joining us, that's who we are. And so when we talk about bringing this mindset to the ACA, that comes from us, bringing that into our spaces, into our courses, into our paddling clubs. And so that's my encouragement from hearing all of you. It's exciting to know that everyone represented here is from a different part of the country and you all are going out and doing this in your spaces. And I've just seen like lots of different names in the chat. Some I recognize, some I don't, meaning like I, that people can bring this to their communities. So as we talk about growing this within the organization, it comes from you. Um, So any other final chats? Otherwise, we can log off and thank you all for partaking in this conversation. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank thank you. you. Thanks for moderating, Tara. And thanks to everyone who um, listened in. Appreciate you.